In South Sudan, hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced following severe flooding. Torrential rains have worsened in the East African nation due to climate change. Months of torrential rains caused by a cyclical weather pattern burst the banks of the Nile, according to scientists who say climate change has exacerbated the problem. Families have been forced to squeeze together and there's not enough land to establish clinics and schools. The oil-rich but impoverished East African nation was already struggling to recover from a five-year civil war. Humanitarian worker Alain Nudeu says the rains are just one of the major issues facing South Sudan. Then you have a situation where you have flooding, food insecurity, and you add COVID to it. In some of those counties also, we have, expect, we have experienced a lot more increase in violence recently. And you add those four things together and really stretching the communities and the families' ability to cope. He also said the UN had allocated $10 million to help flood victims, but needed $40 million more by the end of the year. Retired Army Colonel Barton Dorr has been sworn in as Mali's interim president. Dorr is tasked with presiding over an 18-month transition back to civilian rule following a military coup. The 70-year-old Ndor has served as a defence minister in 2014 and previously was head of the country's air force. En ce moment, donc, à l'arrivée du Bando took the oath of office in front of several hundred military officers, political leaders, and diplomats. Colonel Asimi Goita, who led the August 18 coup that overthrew Ibrahim Boubacar Keita as president was sworn in as vice president during a ceremony in Pamako. Je jure devant Dieu et le peuple malien de préserver en toute fidélité I saw in front of God and the people of Mali to uphold the Republican regime to follow and enforce the Constitution, the transition chart and the law, to fulfill my duties for the people, to uphold the democratic achievements, to ensure the national unit, the country's independence and the integrity of the national territory. I solemnly swear to do everything to work towards African unit. Malian officials hope the inauguration will lead to the lifting of economic sanctions imposed by the economic community of West African states states that officials say have paralyzed the economy. Regional presidents are fearful that the coup in Mali could undermine a regional fight against militants centered in Mali's north and center. But they hope today's inauguration ceremony will be a first step towards civilian rule, although for the initial demands for a purely civilian leadership have not been met. Though described by former colleagues as principled, said in a speech he would crack down on corruption one of the main complaints against Keita's government and stamp out abuses by Mali's armed forces against civilians. I will fight without compromise over expensive elections, electoral fraud, vote buying and the government manipulation of electoral process. Among the audience members, was the ECOWAS envoy, former Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan. Jonathan said on Wednesday that he hoped sanctions would be lifted following those inauguration. Well, for more on this and other events that played out in West Africa this week, particularly Mali and Côte d'Ivoire, I'm now joined via Zoom by a news correspondent based in Abidjan, Liane de Bassompierre. Thanks so much indeed for joining us, Liane. Uh, I know that you're in West Africa, but it feels like uh, we're talking to you from Cape Town. <laughs> So lovely to be on the show. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So a significant day in Mali. Let's begin there. The country has a new president. They do have a new president, and even though he was not elected uh, to be president, he is very much uh, appreciated and accepted by both the junta, the economic uh, community of West African states that had imposed this roadmap uh, to civilian rule, as well as uh, ordinary Malians. So it's a very exciting day for them. They see this as a, a new chapter. He is only interim president, as was rightly mentioned, for the next 18 months uh, after his inauguration today. Um, the uh, junta 
Goiter leader, Asima Goiter, being inaugurated as vice president of uh, that West African nation. We know that they've been suffering immeasurably, not just of the economic uh, impact of COVID, but also of uh, economic sanctions that have been placed on the country following last month's uh, coup. Uh, we don't know that the sanctions will be lifted as yet, so they still need to appoint a prime minister, and that's when economic sanctions should be lifted. Uh, but I think there's, a, there's really a, a will to, to get over this next sta stage, uh, plan elections in the next 18 months, and get back to civilian rule quite quickly. All right. I mean, they talk about uh, civilian rule on the cards. You've got a retired uh, army head uh, as a president and a, a military junta leader as the vice president. The influence of the army will be felt for some time. It will be felt for some time, but it was definitely a compromise that had to be struck between the military, um, the civil society, uh, the economic uh, community of West African states. And he was seen as the, the best compromise option. So everybody uh, seems happy. He ticked all the boxes. And we'll have to check very carefully over the next 18 months how things play out. As you say, they will have a very strong influence on Mali. Uh, but Mali, as you know, has been suffering immeasurably as well in the last few years uh, with the Islamist militant attacks uh, in that country. Um, of course, the interim president today promising that he would be rooting out corruption within the military, within government, um, to help international uh, forces that have been uh, been in Mali for quite some time now to root out uh, that uh, Islamist terrorist threat. All right, so let's leave Mali. Let's come to the country that you're in, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Abidjan, and um, Significant developments taking place there. We saw Alassane Ouattara um, cause pandemonium, even protests, uh, when he said that he was going to run for a third term. Mm -hmm. uh, things are getting quite interesting uh, as we head to the presidential elections. In fact, when I arrived here shortly uh, after January, around January 2017 in the country, um, they already started talking about this uh, presidential election. Uh, we know that there's never been a smooth transition of power in this West African nation. And so uh, this, this is a very much anticipated uh, vote that's taking place. Uh, of course, uh, President Ouattara in March that he would not be standing he would be handing over to, to the next generation. But unfortunately, his chosen successor, Amadou Gong Koulibaly, passed away tragically in July. A month later, he announced that he had accepted his party nomination to run to seek a third term, which the opposition is saying it is unconstitutional. The Constitutional Council has now given him the green light to be at the starting blocks at the 31st of October election. Uh, but the opposition is still up in arms, Peter. Uh, They've called for uh, disobedience, civil disobedience. They've called for people to go to the streets. Um, and they do seem to be unifying against uh, a common enemy, so to speak, which is uh, pr uh, President Ouattara and him seeking the third term. All right. So um, the, there are, the, we talk about the opposition, but I guess the only real recognized, recognizable face is Henri Conan Bédier, uh, the others have been disqualified or are in exile. Mm -hmm. So there were 44 applicants who had applied to the Electoral Commission to run in the elections. Only four have been retained. Uh, the main contenders, of course, are President Alassane Ouattara and former President uh, Henry Konambedier, who's 86 years old. And so he's called, along with the, the other opposition parties, uh, for the civil disobedience campaign. Uh, but, Peter, I was at the, the, the press conference at this big rally that they had with the opposition on Sunday. And since then, really, nobody's taken them up on this um, disobedience, civil disobedience campaign. Um, the streets have been, you know, fairly quiet. We haven't had any major incidents. Um, that juxtaposed to just after the announcement when President Alassane Ouattara said he'd be running for third term, there were some uh, isolated incidents across the country. But um, we may see things still changing. The, the situation is very dynamic at the moment. Uh, we also have um, one of the other presidential candidates who is the ex-National uh, Assembly Speaker and ex-Ribber leader who helped Ouattara ascend to the presidency in 2011. He's been in uh, a self-imposed exile in France since December. And um, he's very, very loud and very vocal on, on social media platforms, but he's not here. And I think 
what's missing on the ground in terms of um, civil disobedience, in terms of uh, organization and planning um, against this third term of Ouattara, is that there isn't a really a face, a charismatic person on the ground who's leading this, as what we've seen in Mali in recent weeks, which ultimately led to the uh, military coup in that country. And so uh, it will be interesting to see how this gets managed. Um, President Ouattara, in fact, I've been traveling with him the last few days. He's been traveling in the Marawe region, which is in the central west of the country. And um, and he's been speaking to young people. He's been speaking to, to older people. He's been speaking to traditional leaders. And, um, and he's saying he's promising peaceful elections. He's saying that, you know, the days of, of military coups, of uh, people taking to the streets, of people dying because of elections are over. Um, and he has promised that the 31st of October will vote will be a peaceful. All right. I remember the last elections uh, that uh, ended up being quite bloody, sparking civil war. Um, there seemed to have been a north-south divide by and large. Does one still get that sense? You know, it depends um, who you speak to. A lot of um, northerners feel that even though Watara hails from that part uh, of the country, they haven't done enough. The present government hasn't done enough uh, in, the, in those regions. Um, they feel that a lot of the interest, big infrastructure investments have been largely in the south, particularly in the economic capital, Abidjan. Um, even the, the, the capital, which I'm in at the moment, which is Yamasukro, has been largely untouched because the region that Yamasukro is in is still an opposition uh, Territory. Uh, but, you know, there, in terms of social cohesion, many analysts say that not enough has been done uh, to kind of forge greater ties between different, different ethnic groups um, and that he still has a lot to do um, in terms of, of social cohesion in the country. Does the president um, have a lot of support? I mean, he is, you've seen him on these walkabouts, so clearly uh, picking locations where he probably would naturally have some kind of support. But when we look at it, um, is he a popular president? He is a popular president, and he's been very successful in the last 10 years. His economy has grown uh, by an average 8% every year since 2012, which was his first uh, full year in office. Of course, until COVID this year, which no country has seen any growth this year. Uh, but up until now, the country's been doing very well, and it's, been, it's really benefited out of his presidency. Obviously, a lot of people have said he's not done enough. Socially, his social programs not being enough. But infrastructurally, uh, he's done very well uh, for the country. Uh, he's created jobs. He's created infrastructure developments that have created jobs. And so he has been. He, he has been very popular. In fact, um, you know, he said to to young people the other day. You know, while the opposition are calling for civil disobedience, we are at work. We are getting things done. Um, so you know, that's why he should be voted for. Where, where's, you know, where the people will be voting for him, I think that the ruling RHDP, compared to the opposition, they've really been motivating their supporters to get their national identity cards, to get uh, on the voters register. So they've been a lot more organized than what the opposition has been. So I think uh, from that perspective, they will get people out to come and vote for them. Uh, mm. Whether the opposition has done the same to the same extent remains to be seen. So the elections are on the horizon. Um, how has uh, campaigning been? Has it been relatively peaceful? So official campaigning only takes place between the 15th of October and the mm. 29th of October, with the vote taking place on the 31st. Uh, but of course, um, you know this what they call state visit at the moment to the Morowe region uh, is part of pre-electoral campaigning, mm. so to speak. And uh, they've really been getting out there. The opposition, I feel has not been um, as organized and organizing rallies, you know, even the, the press conference that they called or the kind of opposition meeting that they called for Sunday, calling for the civil disobedience campaign was organized on the last minute. It was very, not very well um, organized or attended. Um, so they are going to have to step up their game um, to be able to compete with the RHDP, which has been very, uh, very well oiled machine uh, for the last uh, few months already. All right, and uh, perhaps as we start to wrap things up, we've got Mali uh, post-coup, we've got uh, Côte d'Ivoire third term. Is this a concern for democracy in the region where, you know, we've seen these kinds of narratives play out all too often? Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, in, in President Ouattara's case, he's saying that it's it's a painful, it was a painful decision for him to take to go for a third term. His chosen successor had died and there was not enough time to organize uh, a plan B, so to speak, and that the only choice was for him to run again. And I think that's, you know, he's being compared to, in the same way, to uh, Guinea's Alpha Conde, who is seeking re-election on the 18th of October, so just before Alassane Ouattara. And he actually had changed the constitution Constitution this year to be able to do that. So I think it's important to make that distinction between the two West African leaders. Uh, but there does seem to be some, you know, renewed appetite for a uh, longer presidency. You know, they're using terms like, oh, we didn't have enough time to be able to do everything that we wanted to do. Um, but they, they, there wasn't a plan B for Amadou Gong Koulibaly, who was known to have, heart, have had heart problems. Um, you know, he spent two months in France this year, but they maintained that he is the candidate. The fact that there was no succession plan, there were no other leaders that they were propping up in the meantime also speaks volumes uh, that they hadn't been that organized. You know, they were putting all their hopes in, in this one person. Okay, Leanne, we're going to leave it there, but uh, we certainly look forward to talking to you again and uh, hopefully next week to give us uh, another roundup of what's happening in West Africa. Thanks so much indeed for your time this evening. Thanks so much to you, Peter. All right, that's a news correspondent based in Abidjan. Uh, our very own Leanne de Basson-Pierre, because uh, she hails from here in South Africa.